So today we're going to be talking about autonomous security powered by Velodyne. A uh, little bit about myself, my name is Stacy Stevens. I'm the Executive Vice President and Chief Client Officer of Nightscope. Uh, my also, that's my official role with the company, but I'm also one of the co-founders of the company. Uh, so my role in the company is quite expansive. I take care of all of the communications, the public relations, sales, marketing, brand, and everything else. That all fa falls under my purview. Uh, my background, I uh, studied aerospace engineering in college, uh, then went around and turned into a police officer, so don't ask me how that happened, it's a very, very long story. Uh, but I ended up being a police officer in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, and very shortly thereafter started my first company. I've had now four companies, all of them focused on law enforcement and public safety. Uh, in 2011, I was honored by Government Technology Magazine. I was named uh, among their 25 top dreamers, doers, and drivers. Um, all focused on the law enforcement mission. So I have a passion for public safety. It's something that is very near and dear to me. And today what we're going to talk about is how Velodyne has helped make a significant impact in reducing crime. Uh, but the very first thing I want to talk about is a little bit of a spoiler alert. So if there's anybody in the audience who happens to be uh, a fan of the movies or TVs, uh, please plug your ears for just a moment because I'm going to astonish you with the fact that robots in TV shows and movie dramas are not real. I'm sorry to be the one to have to break that to you, uh, but what we're going to talk about today are real robots that are being used in real use cases in the real world, and we're going to go through and talk about their capabilities, which are quite significant. Uh, we're going to talk about the uh, use cases for that. I think this works. Let me see if that yeah, it does actually. Great. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the expectations that we have to set when we go out to deploy these types of technologies to our potential client base. Uh, so the first question that I always get asked when people start asking about the robot is, number one, what is it? What does it do? Uh, the second question I usually am asked is, how does it work? Uh, and I'm going to tell you how it works because it's actually quite similar to human beings. We as human beings go around our lives with five senses. We use those senses to navigate through our own daily lives. Coincidentally, this robot over to my left, to your right, has five sensors that it uses to navigate through its daily life. The very first of which happens to be where we're standing here today in Velodyne's booth. It's a LIDAR, a light detection and ranging device. Uh, in very short, we take a laser beam, shoot it out, we strike an object, we calculate that time of flight back, and now we have a point to plot in a cloud to create a three-dimensional map. Uh, the second set of sensors that we use are sonar. The sonar is just using the same, a similar type of technology except using sound and doing echolocation. So you probably have seen the type of uh, sonar that we have if you look over at this machine here. Uh, over on the side, you probably recognize that from the back bumper of your car. Same type of sensor. It's just uh, we're using it to allow people to, uh, excuse me, to allow the robot to see when somebody has invaded its space versus something passing behind a vehicle. Uh, the next sensor that we talk about is GPS. No different than your car, your navigation system, and your phone. We're just triangulating off of at least three satellites up in the sky to come up with a general information as to where that robot exists in a geospace. Uh, wheel odometry. We're calculating the distance that the wheels travel uh, independently of one another. So we know if one wheel is tracking faster than the other, then we know that the wheels, the, the robot's turning in one direction or the other. If, we, if we're spinning around in circles, we know that as well. And then lastly, there's an inertial measurement unit, or IMU. And the IMU is simply a tilt meter. So again, similar to your phone, the thing that allows you to play games, that allows you to erase something that you've just done, it's an accelerometer and a tilt meter. If you take all five of those and you combine them together, now you have an incredibly accurate picture of our surroundings, as you see from all the displays around the Velodyne booth. Uh, we know where all the obstacles reside within those surroundings, and now we can begin to plot a course through that. And that's how Nightscope has actually been able to operate for the past five years in public spaces uh, among dogs, cats, monkeys, goats, children, adults, you name it. Uh, so we're very excited to talk about uh, how we've been able to affect things today. Uh, so a little bit about how uh, we use LiDAR and how we use Velodyne's technology. Uh, we use the second one here from the left, the Puck and you see that mounted on top of the robot here to my left. Uh, the puck is giving us a full 360 degree view of our environment around us. And you can see here from the images on your screen, 
uh, these are the different uh, scopes or cones of visibility that we have from the different sensors. So the LiDARs are giving us one area of, of view, the sonars are giving us a separate area of view, and they perform different functions. So the LiDAR for us is looking more long range, the sonar for us is looking more short range, but they both, both play an integral part in our ability to navigate in these very complex environments. So because we have the ability to navigate in these uh, very complex environments, now we can talk about the use case and the mission of Nightscope. Nightscope's mission is to be able to reduce crime. So some of those advantages that this, that this technology affords us the ability to do is we have very large autonomous robots that are a very effective physical deterrent. So rather than using CCTV, uh, uh, small cameras mounted in weird spaces, uh, you actually have something that's on the ground that's eye level. So your evidentiary quality coming from this camera is much better than anything that's up in, in high spaces. So going back to my career as a police officer, I can literally count on probably the number of digits that I have on my body, how many times I went into a crime and looked for video that was useful and they were actually able to provide that for me. It happens incredibly rarely. Now we have the ability to collect data and collect evidence in a way that is much more useful and much more, uh, and I'll talk about some of the successes that we have, uh, but much more successful in prosecuting people. Uh, now because we have a fully autonomous robot, they can be incredibly productive in these very boring, monotonous and uh, routine jobs. People are terrible at doing the same thing over and over and over again. So if you, depending on which study you look at, anywhere between eight and 14 minutes is the maximum amount of time that a person can be useful doing the same thing over and over. Robots are great at doing the same thing over and over and they don't complain about it, they don't call in sick and you don't have to worry about the medical liability, the pension liability or anything else associated with that. So doing those things over and over again, uh, even dangerous type work is something robots do well. Uh, our, our robots also are fully autonomous for charging. So we're not having to go and plug it in. It's not like your electric vehicle where you pull it into your garage at the end of the night and you go out and you stick a plug in it. They dock themselves. Very similar to uh, the little robots that run around your house and clean your floors. Ours do the same thing. So when I talk about fully autonomous operation, hands free, uh, people free, that's what we're talking about. Uh, sensors on the robot allow you to record and retain more data than any human could ever possibly do. So when we, again, thinking about the crime, uh, the crime uh, use case, when we stick a robot in an area and we're asking the robot to give us information on a specific uh, incident, the robot's going to have instant recall and clarity of that event. If you ask a person, hey, what happened in this particular case, then you're relying on witness statements, you're relying on the human fallacy, and your descriptions of people and events and everything become, become skewed. In the best of cases, your, your ability to recall events is skewed. But when you're under stress, it's tenfold worse. So the robots give you the ability to collect much better data. The robots engage the public and enhance the brand. Everybody who's walked by this robot has stopped, paused, taken a picture of it. They've gone up and done selfies with it. We have uh, robot selfies are an actual thing. If you do a quick search on social media, you'll see thousands and thousands of pictures of our robots with people and their dogs and other things. Uh, they're very, very engaging. And that's something that, in when you talk about security, it's something that's missing. Public safety, you hear a lot about uh, community policing, you hear about specific programs that are put into place to bring the community and the law enforcement agencies together. These robots help to bridge some of that gap because now you have a product that is not threatening, but still gives you intelligence on specific instances. And ultimately, we want to save time and money for our client base, so that's very important. Now we're gonna talk about, we've talked about the advantages, we're gonna talk about why our clients are telling us they're using the technology. Number one, they're highly visible force multiplier. As I said before, using them to be able to deter, the robot's five and a half feet tall, three feet wide, weighs 400 pounds. It's very conspicuous. There's lights on board. It actually makes a, so a sound as it patrols. So its intent is to give you the ability that you can see that. Bad guys, again, I'm sorry to tell you, it's not what you see in the movies. We're not, they're not all masterminds. That accounts for less than one half of 1% of crimes that occur in this country. The vast majority of crimes are crimes of passion, crimes of opportunity. And if you can deter them by having this large physical presence, 
that's actually going to cut down on crime. And I'll talk a little bit more when we get to the successes about what that equates to. Uh, license plate recognition allows us to, to secure parking lots and structures. Uh, my largest, largest parking structure that I'm patrolling today is nine stories tall in Denver, Colorado. So we have a robot that's literally going up and down the patrol, the, and patrolling the parking structure every single day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The robots help mitigate workplace violence and they improve public safety. How they're, they're mitigating that is, if you think of for a moment, Domestic violence is the primary cause of workplace violence. People who get into fights at home and then they bring that to the workplace. They're, they're causing a disturbance. Uh, they didn't get resolution, so they just can't let it go. Uh, that's the number one cause of workplace violence. Those are known people. If you can use some of the technology that we have built into the, to the robot, like the license plate recognition or facial recognition or signal detection for mobile devices, we can blacklist known threats. So if you have somebody who's a victim of domestic violence, you can offer them up the ability to blacklist the license plate of their abuser. That way you have, again, another insulative barrier to keep that person from coming into the workplace and causing a disturbance. So again, another use case from specifically from our clients. Robots are able to patrol hard to reach and often neglected spaces. And what I mean by that is if, if we go back to the scenario where we talk about uh, security and CCTV, there's only so many cameras you can plumb into a building. There's only so many places that you can get visibility to. There's always going to be those areas where you can't get electricity, you can't get a camera mount, or you just don't have the appropriate angle. So having a mobile robot that moves around on the ground allows them to get more eyes and ears in different spaces, and it also randomizes the ability for people to be able to predict what's going on and where they're going to be detected. Again, thinking through the, the bad guy's mind. Uh, continuous human patrol was a financial challenge. Uh, one of our key uh, uh, clients are what I like to call the tweeners. So you have a company that's grown up and they're somewhere between 50 and $200 million in revenue. Uh, they've not quite made it into, you know, the three, four, 500 employees yet. And they're just starting to, to understand, okay, we need to have a, an effective security program in place. They go out and they visit with the Securitas and the Allied Universals of the world and they say, hey, we need security, how much does it cost? And they get the price tag back and they go into sticker shock. This actually fills that gap because it's a much more affordable way of doing security, but you're get, still getting that patrol, you're getting that presence, and you're able to do so at a much more affordable cost. So uh, rather than having a guard run around for 24 seven, these younger companies are able to deploy a robot early on, and then as they grow, then they can begin to fill those gaps with humans as needed. Uh, and then as I alluded to a, a little bit ago, the eye level data uh, provides uh, the users to, be, uh, to, to have much better evidence and to be able to reduce crime by using something that is more effective. Now this map that I'm showing here is probably the most, for me personally, is the most exciting thing I get to share with you today. We are in the middle of the world's largest consumer electronics show. There are thousands of booths of people talking about technology. You can go right next door and look at any of the autonomous spaces, uh, but who's commercialized it? $80 billion has been spent in the autonomous space so far, and who can name me one company that's already commercialized it? I can. Nightscope. Nightscope actually commercialized the technology in uh, 2015, and we have been operating 24-7, 365, across the entire country in 15 states. We are, to our knowledge, to our investors' knowledge, and anybody else that we've talked to, the only company on the planet who can claim that. So we're very excited to be able to show this slide, and we're able to do so as a direct result of Velodyne's help and the ability for us to be able to use that technology to navigate autonomously. Uh, so I told you I would share with you some of the wins that we have had. Uh, we've had numerous crime-fighting wins. Uh, when, when I started the company uh, in 2013, I had hoped that within five to ten years I would be able to look at somebody with a straight face and tell them we were able to reduce crime by 50% in any area where we deploy a robot. Never in my wildest dreams did I imagine I would be able to tell somebody I'm able to reduce crime by 100%, yet I have countless clients claiming exactly that. So if you go to do a, and I'll show it at the end, if you go do a Google search on Nightscope crime fighting wins, you'll actually be able to see a lot of these wins and the claims of our clients and what they've been able to use it for. 
We helped the law enforcement issue an arrest warrant for a burglar and a felony property damage. This one was actually just recently adjudicated. Uh, so a young man came on a property, caused damage, broke into two buildings, had three felonies against him. 100% of the evidence came from the robot and he ended up having to plead guilty to all three felonies and he's been sentenced and that just came down in December. So very excited to know three felonies cleared up as a result of our robot. We helped a law enforcement issue arrest uh, warrant for a sexual predator. This was in a shopping center. Uh, somebody who was stalking women uh, and then uh, flashing them and sexually gratifying himself after the fact and we were able to catch him using the robot and prosecute him and he was arrested. Uh, helped the security guard catch a theft and uh, catch a thief in a retail establishment. Fraud stopped a fraudulent insurance claim. Uh, we stopped a fraudulent insurance claim by somebody again who was trying to claim that uh, the property owner was negligent and did not put a proper ramp in place uh, where she needed to walk down, and she pushed a stroller downstairs and fell and hurt herself. Nobody, no baby was in the stroller, thank thankfully. Uh, but she tried to claim it was their fault. The robot captured the entire incident and was actually able to show there was a handicap ramp immediately adjacent to the stairs that she pushed herself down. So we stopped that, that claim. Uh, caught an armed robbery suspect. This, this was a uh, carjacking. And this is an interesting one because I talked about a little bit earlier humans' ability to provide evidence. This actually had a security guard witness a carjacking from start to finish and could not provide one shred of evidence. Our robot provided the evidence of uh, person, the uh, suspect description, vehicle description that he drove in up, weapon description, the vehicle that he drove away in, and the license plate of that vehicle, and the direction of travel. All of that was used to apprehend the guy within 45 minutes of his departure from that location. Uh, we've eliminated vehicle break-ins. We caught a corporate vandal, somebody who was terminated, and then went back to fire, uh, went back to key the car of the person who terminated her, and the robot captured that. Uh, and then we've eliminated trespassers. So these are some of the instances again where having this type of technology that enables robots to be able to patrol in the security space has certainly come to to play in our benefit. Uh, so a couple of the robots that we've had, we've commercialized three different robots so far, one of which you see over here to your right, my left. Uh, this is the K5. What we're going to look at first is the K3. The K3 is a smaller version of this robot. This is five and a half feet tall. This is four and a half feet tall. This is three feet wide. That is two feet wide. Uh, 400 pounds, 340 pounds. So two different robots, but two different use cases. This is intended for indoor use, so it's meant for environmentally protected areas. This is for outdoor use. It's intended to be outdoors. We've got robots running in the deserts of San Bernardino all the way up to the inclement uh, weather in Minnesota. Uh, so we've, we've kind of traversed all the different uh, possibilities as far as weather is across the US. Uh, if you think of the use cases, warehouses, corporate campuses, office, shopping centers, those are all areas in which this robot becomes very effective. Uh, the K5, again, outdoor use, so parking structures, parking lots, perimeter protection, uh, airports, seaports, anywhere where you have a large geographic footprint that you're looking to protect, you can do so with the larger robot. Now, each one of the robots generates a ton of data to the degree of about 90 terabytes per robot per year. That's how much information we have to move around. The robot pushes that information to and from using cellular. We're using uh, LTE right now, and we're also in uh, Verizon's 5G uh, incubator, so we're working to do 5G to be able to improve the transfer of that data as well. Uh, but in order to get that information to the people who matter, we have to have a user interface. So what we're talking about here is done as a subscription basis that includes the robot, the charge station, the user interface, all the service, the maintenance, and upgrades. That's all included, and this is also part of that. So we have the Nightscope Security Operations Center. It's a browser-based user interface. That's where all the information comes to the person who needs to, uh, who's securing a property. Uh, I'm not going to get in too deep on what the capabilities are, uh, but I'll just kind of super high level, 360 degree video, two-way audio, license plate recognition, thermal imaging, people detection, signal detection for mobile devices, face detection, uh, face, I'm sorry, facial recognition, not face detection. Uh, and also we are working on and have an alpha prototype built that is currently doing visible weapon detection. So 
the capabilities of the robots are quite immense. Uh, it's not just a roving camera that's moving around. Uh, that allows people to do 24-7 monitoring from anywhere in the world. So anywhere you have an internet connection, a Chrome browser, and uh, your, your user credentials to your user interface, you can access your robot. So if I wanted to go and look and see what my robots were doing at my campus right now, I could type into a computer in my, uh, use my credentials, and I could see exactly what's happening. Now, uh, I wanted to cover just a little bit about uh, additional capabilities because most people are only thinking about, when they think about Velodyne, they're thinking about mapping and they're thinking about autonomous operation. That's not all you use that for. That, there are so many things that you can use the LiDAR for, and this is one of them. We use LiDAR as part of the people detection uh, capability of our robot. What it's doing is, once we detect there is an obstacle that's moving around, we use the analytics from a video standpoint to identify that it's a person, and then when we get a detection that is close enough from the LiDAR, we use the robot to make an announcement. Welcome to CES. Thank you for visiting Nightscope. Any type of announcement that's specific to the client that they want to do, you can broadcast a message to that person. If we add in the facial recognition component, we can now begin to identify that person. We can greet people. So if you look at uh, Pachanga Casino in California, they have uh, six of our robots. They have these at each one of the entrances. They're identifying people who are coming and going, people that they know they don't want at their casino, but they're also able to identify people that they do know and that they do want in their casino. So like their big gamblers, the whales, people that you hear about who come in and just spend a boatload of money. They want to know about them as soon as possible. Currently, the only way to do that is if they check in somewhere or if they use their little gambler's card, plug it in, and now you know that that person is here. These robots give them the ability to identify somebody before they've ever even walked through the door. And now they have an alert, hey, Bob Smith is here. He came in the east door. He was here at X time. And those, those notifications are instant. And all of that, again, is afforded by having the LiDAR uh, that we have on the robot. Uh, the license plate that recognition that I talked about, that allows us to get a measurement of the distance of cars backing out of parking spaces. So you don't want the robot to come running behind somebody who's pulling out of a parking space. We know when a car's backing out, when that car backs out and it comes into the path of the robot, the robot can then take evasive action. Stop, reverse, go back to uh, from whence it came, pause, wait till the obstacle clears, because again, we have full 360 degree capabilities and now we can move on as soon as that car has cleared. So again, another way of using the technology for something other than just navigation. Uh, another one of our capabilities that has nothing to do with the LiDAR, but is our, uh, one of the things that are big for our corporate clients is thermal uh, detection. So looking for fires, things that are heat anomalies. Uh, signal detection for mobile devices. So if you come into an area within uh, 400, uh, 400 feet of one of our robots, we know your device, the device type, the manufacturer of the device, and the MAC address of that device. When it entered the area, when it left the area, subsequently the dwell time, and also how close it was to the robot at the time that we captured it. Uh, broadcast capabilities with uh, 16 microphones on the robot and a uh, very large speaker. We are able to use that as an intercom, so the robot acts sort of like a cell phone uh, or a vo voice over IP device. It allows us to talk through the robot, allows somebody who's in distress to contact somebody in a security uh, center for help. Uh, and then we can also use that for, again, specific messages. We have pre-recorded messages that are specific to our clients. If they have specific uh, messages that they want to deliver, for example, I told you we operated in Minnesota. One of the things that they wanted the robots broadcasting during the winter was, icy conditions exist, please be careful. So that was a broadcast message that, again, using the people detection, whenever it detected somebody who just came out of a building, the robot would broadcast that message telling them be safe. And again, all of this coming back to something that's going to be time saving and improving uh, the existing way of doing security. Uh, security is purchased in hours per week. It's not, it's not a human. You're not talking about a, a head like you would in a typical corporate situation. Uh, security is bought by hours. And what the robots allow you to do is get a full 24 hours of use out of a robot, and then only humans can, or humans can only do eight hours. So in a typical week, if you wanted 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, you're going to have 168 hours per person that you are providing for, uh, for that use. So 
168 hours to have one person patrol 24-7 all week long. If you remove one head and you add a 24-hour shift robot, you're increasing the amount of hours of security that you get almost by a double. So 296 hours versus the 168 hours. This is why people are looking at this technology as a game changer and a way of improving the way they're doing their security today. What that calculates down to in the bottom line is in a typical human man guarding, you're looking at about $14,600 per month. For ours, depending on the robot and the use case, anywhere between $4,500 and $9,500 per month. Uh, the 8300 has actually gone up because we've added some capabilities, the facial recognition and the thermal camera, for example. Uh, but obviously still much lower than the 14000 to get a human to patrol. Uh, so I told you I'd share with you one of the case studies that we did. Uh, so you could actually look this up. If you go Google uh, XPO and Nightscope, you'll be able to get all this information. This client actually published, excuse me, this client actually published a press release last year. And in that press release, they, they saved $125,000 in their first six months of deployment. So annualized, they saved a quarter of a million dollars on their security program at one location. That was just one location. They have ex since expanded the program. We're at three different locations for this client. Uh, so they're saving a lot of money. They reported a 100% reduction in crime. 100% reduction. Again, never would have imagined that, but super excited. Uh, they were awarded, con uh, we were awarded contracts for additional machines in different locations. Uh, and they're also looking at corporate wide usage. So XPO Logistics, one of the largest logistics suppliers in the US, they have a footprint all across the country and they're looking at expanding this program. So that excites us tremendously. And again, all because we're powered by Velodyne. So thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take your questions and then I will be here a little bit later after as well if you have any additional questions.